multi, multi architecture is more stable as it goes across all these architectures. So here's another case where diversity is good. And it's also a 32-bit or 64-bit system. In fact, Linux has been 64-bit since 1995 when I gave the alpha to Linus Torvalds. Why is this important? With a 32-bit system, as a programmer, I can address 4 billion bytes of data at one time. If I want to look at more data than that, I have to go to what we call a different address space. This is known as edge programming because I have to stop what I'm doing in one part of the program with one part of the data and I have to carry that across to another part of the program and another part of the data in another address space. And this tends to be a tricky type of programming. If I have an address space that's big enough, I can gently treat all the data as one lump. And this becomes a lot easier to do the programming and I make a lot fewer mistakes. So what type of problems am I talking about? I'm talking about modeling the weather or editing a large movie or doing any other thing with huge amounts of data. So with 32 bits, we can look at 4 billion bytes of data at a time. But with 64 bits, we can look at 4 billion times 4 billion bytes of data. How big is that? 4 billion times 4 billion bytes of data is a gigabyte a second every second of the day, every day of the year, for the next 5,386 years. Or, it's looking at 128 bytes of data for every millimeter on the surface of the Earth, including all the oceans. That's how much data it is. So, practically speaking, there are very few problems that we can't address in 64 bytes of data. And that means that we can do this on Linux a lot easier than we could do this on a 32-bit only system. Microsoft did not have a true 32, a true 64-bit system until Microsoft Vista, 11 years after Linux was 64-bit. And finally, Linux has multiple uh, network stacks, not just TCP IP, but X.25, UUCP, Bluetooth, many, many different types of network stacks that are very well written, very efficient, and can be used to do all sorts of types of networking tasks. In addition, Linux supports many different types of file systems. It can read and write a FAT file system. It can read and write an, a Microsoft uh, NTFS file system. It can read and write Samba file system over the network. It, can, it also has a whole series of log-based and journal file systems which are very stable and very secure. You can encrypt all of your data in the file system. Either the entire file system could be encrypted or you can encrypt it on a file by file basis for security. These are all capabilities of the Linux kernel and more. Okay. Linux kernel is also very modular. It can load modules as it needs it. So you can start off with a very small kernel and the kernel will load the modules and device drivers as they're needed. You don't have to have them all in memory at the same time. It can do soft real time. So if you're listening to music or you're trying to do audio editing and stuff like that, the Linux kernel is just as good for doing that as it is in running an Oracle database. It can also do real hard time. What is the difference between soft real time and real hard time? 
Soft real time is where you're doing something that if it messes up every once in a while, it's okay. But hard real time is when your nuclear power plant is melting and you want to get those rods lowered very quickly. That's hard real time. And Linux can do both of those. Now, Linux is also a highly available kernel. We can set up two Linux systems that if one does fail because the hardware breaks or failure in the software, the other system will completely take over until the first system can be repaired. We call this a highly available heartbeat system and Linux has been able to do this for many years. Linux can also be used in a, uh, a highly uh, high capacity system it's what we call Beowulf supercomputers, high performance computing. And you can actually have a Linux kernel with multiple machines that look as if they're only one machine. We call this open OpenMosix. And you can migrate processes from one system to the other while the process is running without stopping it. Linux is a highly secure system. We have several different security models. One is called uh, Security Enhanced Linux, and the other is called, um, I'm having a mental blank. Uh, I'll think of it sooner or later, but there's two different security models for Linux, and it is a very stable system. And you get all of this for free. You can pull all of this down off the internet and put it on your system and run it for free. And it's the same Linux system that runs on supercomputers as runs in my notebook. There's no difference in the kernel. There's only slight differences in the kernel for things that run in embedded systems. But all of this code is available for you to work with. Now, I've been using the word free because I speak the English language. And the problem with the word free in English is it has two meanings. Free is in freedom, and free is in gratis. And too many he people hear the word free software and they think, oh, it's free as in gratis. I, you know, maybe, I, maybe it's not that good. Why, why don't they charge for it, you know? But what we're really talking about is the free as in freedom. And this five very specific freedoms. Number one, the freedom to use the code for any purpose. If I write free software and you say, I want to use your software to make an atom bomb, I'm not allowed to say to you, no, you can't use it for that. Or you say, I want to use your software to help somebody have an abortion. I'm not allowed to say to you that you can't use it for that. Because that's a very tricky road to go down. Before you, before you know it, nobody can use the software for anything. Because people say, I don't like you making hammers for my software, or I don't like you killing animals with my software, or, you know, it's up to the person who's using the software to just have the morals of what they're doing with it or not. But we say you should be able to use the software for any purpose. Number two, the freedom to read the source code, to be able to see how the software works, to make sure that the software is doing only what you want it to and nothing more. Maybe the software is spying on you. How do you know? Is the software actually written to give you the proper answer? You don't know if you can't look at the source code. The freedom to change the software to make it meet your needs. A few years ago, the Swahili people in Africa needed a word processor to help them that would work with them in a Swahili language. And they went to Microsoft and they said, please, we'd like to have a word processor that works in the Swahili language. And at that time, Microsoft said, no. It's not enough business for us to make that change for you. So the Swahili people went to the open office people and said, could we have open office working in Swahili? 
And of course the answer was yes. You just change it to meet your needs. And so a few months later the Swahili people had a word processor that actually worked in Swahili. There is a slight problem however. In the Swahili language there is no equivalent of the word download. In, in Swahili download means you take a package off of a truck and you put it on the ground. So Swahili people had to have a whole different meaning for the word download. And finally, the only freedom that you really don't have is the freedom to take away somebody else's freedoms. So if I create free software and I give it to you, and you take that software and you make a change to it, you create a binary distribution, and you only give your binaries to somebody else, you've taken away their freedom to change the software that you made. You can't take away their freedom if I gave you the freedom in the first place. That's where free software is better than open source. However, there was a lot of people who said, we have a bad reaction to the to name free software. And they created the concept of open source. And open source has some of the freedoms of free software, but not all of them. And there are many different licenses in open source. And you need to understand what these licenses are about because they can affect the way that you can use the software and that you can redistribute the software to somebody else. I'll just go over one of them, the artistic license. This is a license that's used by the language Perl. And Larry Wall, the creator of Perl, said, I want to have a license that if somebody changes Perl and makes it, makes it different than what I have, they have to give those changes back to me. And if I incorporate those changes into the language Perl, then they can call their change also, they can call it Perl. Now the reason for this is, he wanted only one language called Perl. But if I give you the source code for Perl and you change it, and you still call it Perl, then people start to get confused. Is Larry's Perl, or is yours Perl? You can make the change, and you can call it Sam, or Fred, or Alice, or anything you want, except the word Perl. And that's what the artistic license is about. It allows the artist to have control over their software, but it allows you to make the changes that you want. And all of these definitions are at this location. So they're easy to read and you can figure out which license is best for you. Now, a lot of times you'll hear discussions about intellectual property. And you'll say, if we open up our software, we expose our intellectual property, we won't make a lot of money, you know, the economy will fall apart. But this is simply not true. There are companies like Red Hat and SUSE which are making money and are profitable and they pay programmers and they base all of their business upon a service model which allows them to continue to make money. But open source can also allow small companies to flourish because they don't have to go in and spend a lot of money on software to run their business. An Oracle database engine could cost you $100,000, but a MySQL database engine is free. And if you don't have the $100,000, you can't get Oracle. But you can get a very good relational database engine called MySQL or Postgres for free. So this can allow small businesses to start up and get going and start making money. If you're in Vietnam, 
you typically make about four US dollars every day. For you to be able to buy Microsoft Office at four hundred dollars, you have to work for a hundred days without eating or sleeping or buying food or taking your girlfriend or your boyfriend out on a date. And no wonder that the piracy rate in Vietnam is 96%. 96% of all the software used in Vietnam is stolen. If, if I was in Vietnam like that, I'd put a patch on my eye and say, R, 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 matey. And I'd steal software too. But with free software, they can pull it down off the net, use it, and if they need to have a change made, they don't have to pay $100 an hour to a United States programmer. They can get a university student in their own country, pay them a dollar a day and a six pack of beer, and get the change made. You're in the same boat. In Brazil, if you use free software and you need a change made, you can hire a local programmer in Brazil to make that change, paying them at the local payment rate. And that money stays inside of Brazil. It doesn't go outside of Brazil to the United States or some other country. When the money stays inside of Brazil, that person then buys some of your products. And that money continues to circulate inside of Brazil. But as soon as that money leaves Brazil, it's probably gone forever. Because there's only so much cachaça that Bill Gates can drink. Now, where can you get free software? If you go to a place called SourceForge.net, you'll find out that there's over 324,000 different software projects out there that are written by registered programmers, 3.4 million registered programmers. Now Microsoft has 70,000 employees. 24,000 of them are in sales and marketing and therefore have no useful purpose. Of the numbers that are left, some of those people run the cafeteria. They're guards. They're people that put software into boxes and they take software out of boxes. And actually, if you think about the number of people in Microsoft who have the title of software engineer, it's probably about seven to eight thousand people. Now people say to me, Mad Dog, I've been out there to that site, and they have a hundred music players. I only need one. And maybe only ten percent of those projects out there are significant. Maybe only ten percent of them still have people working on them. Maybe only 10% of those 3.4 million people actually do a lot of work. But okay, let's take a look at that. 10% of 324,000 pro projects is 32.4 thousand projects, which is more software than Microsoft and IBM and Oracle and a bunch of other companies have ever made put together. 10% of 3.4 million is way more programmers than Oracle and IBM and Microsoft have put together. And these programmers don't take coffee bakes or vacations. These people do work because they're passionate about it. And they know that their source code is going to be visible for other people to see. They can't hide behind a company's name. They'll be criticized by their fellow programmers if their programs fail. So these people take a lot of pride in what they do. The free software that's out there is not just Linux and BSD. 
A lot of the software also works on Windows and Apple products. And there's some software that works on all the different platforms. So you can have the same text editor across every single platform you want. It works exactly the same. You can have the same database across every single platform you want. You can have the same audio tools across every single platform you want. This is the flexibility of free software. It's software for business and enterprise. Uh, content management systems, customer relationship management systems, ERP systems, all sorts of different things for running your business and all of them are free as in freedom and free as in cost. You have home and education systems, software for running schools, kindergarten through 12th grade. There's games. A lot of them are not as sophisticated as some of the games that you play, but they're still reasonable games. Scientific and engineering programs for doing calculus, manipulating mathematics, security and utilities and systems administration. But more than this, you don't have to use the entire program. Maybe you would like to write something, but you don't know really how to do it. You can go out there and find a program that does something along the lines of what you want to do, and you can use part of that program in doing your solution. This saves you a lot of time in, in having to write all of the code yourself. And it's code that's already been used successfully in another program. So it's less likely to have bugs in it than the code that's been written the very first time. You don't have to use everything. You can use parts of it. Now, there is a company in Redmond, Washington that set up a program called Shared Source. And this was because a lot of their customers said, we like this open source thing, we like looking at the source code, we like changing it, but uh, you, know, you don't allow us to do that. And so this company set up this program called Shared Source that said, oh, you can read the source code, but you can't change it. And we're not going to let you redistribute that source code to any of your customers. And we're not going to let everybody do this because, you know, the Chinese are not very good about obeying laws. And we're not going to let a lot of small companies do this, only the really large ones. And in universities, well, forget universities, you can't trust them at all. And, you know, if my godchildren shared their toys the way this company shares their source code, I would send all my children to the bedroom. So I say, if it's not completely open, it's worse than if it's completely closed. Because if it's completely closed, at least you know where you stand. But when you're half open, you don't know what to do. And that's the problem with their shared source program. Now, a lot of people say to me, if it's free software, can I charge money for it? And the answer is, you can. You can charge money for writing free software under a free software license and give it away. In fact, in the 25 years that I've known Richard Stallman, he has not one time said, that you shouldn't be able to sell free software. It's just that after you sell it, the customer should have the freedoms that we talked about. And that almost limits how much money you can make on each piece of software. So you can charge a little bit for the service of distributing it, making bug fixes and things like that. But if you try and charge too much, the person will say, well, under the terms of the license, I'm going to just make copies myself. So 
you're limited, but you can still charge for the software. Now, people say to me, why do people do this? Why do people give away free software? And some people do it to make a living. I've been making a living with free software for the last 20 years. But some people say, I do it because my main job is something else. And I'm an amateur at writing this software. Maybe my job is working for Oracle, writing their database engine. But I always wanted to write the kernel of an operating system. So that's my hobby. And people say, well, it can't be very good if these people are not professional programmers. The thing is that most of the people who work in the Linux kernel are professional programmers. It's just that their profession doesn't have them working on kernel software all the time. Most of the people who work inside the Linux kernel have either a master's degree or a PhD in computer science. And most of them work as professional programmers. But if you think about it, you have amateur football players. And a lot of your amateur football players are pretty good. Almost as good or maybe even better than some of your professional football players. And the only difference between being an amateur football player and a professional is that you're not paid to be an amateur football player. Or you have amateur painters who paint a painting. And when they get finished with it, they do not stick it in a closet. They put it up on the wall for everybody to see. And every once in a while they take it to an art contest to have judges look at it and maybe make their painting better. And these are all the reasons why people write free software. It's because they want the recognition, they want the experience, and they want to find out, can they do it better the next time? Now, in the period of, of, of 1998, all of a sudden, the internet started to explode. And people found out that Linux systems had everything necessary to be a great internet system. And it was cheap. Instead of being on an expensive SunSpark workstation running Solaris, you could have an inexpensive Intel server running Linux. But most importantly, if there was a bug, if there was a threat of some type, you had the source code so you could fix that problem in a very short period of time. Many years ago, there was a worm that was going around to Unix systems creating problems. It took my company, Digital Equipment Corporation, three weeks to generate the binary patch for our customers. In the free and open source space, they fixed the problem in three hours. So who got the better service? Our customers or the free software customers? People also started using Linux as file and print servers because Linux can act as a server for Apple systems, Microsoft systems, and Linux systems. And it supports a wide range of different file systems and networking. And people say, well, so what if you get the source code? Why is that important to me? It's because you have the capability of fixing the problems even though your supplier is not, doesn't care about you. Let's say that you've been using Windows XP and you've been using it and you're perfectly happy with it. Microsoft says we're not going to fix any patches anymore for Windows XP. They find a security bug. You can't fix it. You are vulnerable. If you were using Linux, you could take the source code for Linux, send it to a programmer, have them fix the problem, 
and you can continue using that version of Linux and for all of time. Also, enhancements. How many of you think that if you called up Microsoft and asked them to make one little change to Windows, that Microsoft would listen to you? That's what I thought. You can get that done with Linux. Now, Linux is also used on supercomputers. We call them Beowulf systems. In the period of 1994 to 1995, the world was having a problem. Supercomputer companies were going out of business. And two people, Dr. Thomas Sterling and Donald Becker of NASA, came up with the idea of hooking together many, many PCs and creating paralyzed code to create a supercomputer that would give you the power of one that cost 40 times as much money. And these became known as, super as Beowulf supercomputers or high performance computers. And today, out of the top 500 fastest supercomputers in the world, 98% of them run Linux. A couple run BSD and exactly one runs Windows. And that's only because Microsoft pays them to run Windows. You can actually build one of these yourself. At Oak Ridge National Labs in the United States, they took 48 cast-off PCs, PCs that have been replaced by faster systems. They put them on the floor. Here are the keyboards. There's a keyboard that fell off. And they hooked them together with simple Ethernet and put Linux on them and created a supercomputer. We could create a fantastic supercomputer here just by running the right software on it. And these are two of the distributions that you can have. One is called ROX and the other is called OSCAR. They're available in the net. You can pull them across and you can put them on your computer and you can create a supercomputer. By using virtual machines on your PC, you can actually create an entire supercomputer right on your own PC. And you can practice programming that supercomputer on your PC. When you get your program correct, you can take it to a real supercomputer and see it run very, very fast. From the very big systems of supercomputers, we come down to embedded systems where we're building in applications like to run a toaster or a microwave oven or a TV. The people that were making these things realized that Linux was a free operating system that supported a wide range of processors like the ARM processor and Motorola that used a very small amount of power. And it also supported networking stacks so these things could now talk to each other. And so almost overnight, Linux became the most used operating system in doing embedded system work. And that still is true today. The Android phone uses the Linux kernel. Linux has lots of device drivers available for it, lots of network stacks, but most importantly, there's no per unit cost in the royalty. So if I make 20 million phones, I pay the same amount of royalty as I make for one, which is zero. And this means a lot to people that are manufacturing in high volume. This is an entire server system with a one gigabyte IBM disk on the back. That's a United States quarter. That's a USB connector and that's an ethernet cable and it runs Linux. This is a watch that was made by IBM. It runs the Linux kernel inside of it and that's a shell script there that says, that prints out the word hello watch instead of hello world. Now, 
the desktop has a wide range of different windowing systems available for it. So you get to choose the one you want, whether it be GNOME, KDE, or a variety of others. A complete office package available for it. If you're in China, you have the Red Flag office package, which works with Mandarin. And if you're Korean, the Hancom office package works with, with uh, Korean. There's experiments in making even cheaper computers. So for uh, schools, they have computers who will have one system box and four different video box video cards. So four people can share the same computer and make it worth one quarter the cost. There's also a project called LTSP, the Linux Terminal Server Project, which uses thin clients and one server system, also very useful in schools. It's easy to maintain and is cheap and saves on electricity. There's also about 4,500 commercial applications available for Linux that you can buy from companies that support them. And there's a series of emulators that work on top of Linux too. There's a Wine emulator that allows you to run Windows programs on top of Linux. And RD allows you to run programs from the old Macintosh on top of Linux too. So there's huge numbers of applications available for Linux, you just have to look for them. Standards are very important in the open source space. We build our applications around standards. There are certain companies that take standards and bend them or twist them and make proprietary versions of their standards. This is very bad for everybody. The free and open source community builds our code around standards and we're very proud of our work in the standards group. In fact, we started a whole different group called the free standards group that puts out different standards for Linux systems so that an application that works on one distribution will work on another distribution and another distribution. We also have certifications for systems administrators. The Linux Professional Institute does certifications for systems administrators so that when you go out and look for a job, you can say to the person, I've received this level of training in Linux and I've passed this test you know, this is one more reason for you to hire me. CompTIA is a worldwide set of certifications that also supports Linux. And then there are certifications that are distribution specific, like for Red Hat and SUSE. Most people can get support for Linux from major vendors like IBM, Hewlett Packard, Dell, and others. Or you can get uh, support from independent support organizations, companies like ForLinux or Prosergs or um, Procus, and other systems, other companies out there. News groups and mailing lists are places you can get support as well as websites. Now, there's a couple of different topics I'd like to cover briefly because what we've been talking about so far is the software. There's an issue around copyright and licensing. In the United States, when you write anything, whether it's a book, a magazine article, or a piece of software, it's automatically covered by copyright. It belongs to you. And nobody can use it without your permission. But what we do with free software is we license it out freely. We put a license in there called the GPL which allows people to use the software without having to ask us individually for the permission. The same thing has been done for the Creative Commons, for licensing for pictures or music or other things. So that if you, if you license your pictures under the Creative Commons, people can use them, but use them in ways that you approve of. They, they may not be able to sell them for money under the license, but they could, you know, or you can allow them to modify them or not modify them. 
So if you've never looked at Creative Commons as a way of licensing what you do, please do that. Another thing we're talking about is open formats. The ability to exchange information between programs. MPEG-3 is not an open format. It is a patented format that if you use an MPEG-3 player or an MPEG-3, or you try and create an MPEG-3 system, you owe somebody some money. Og Vorbis is a non-royalty bearing set of codecs. And you can use them freely without having to worry about paying patent costs or copyright costs. We have a whole series of open standards that we're working with, and finally some open business practices. Now that's the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk is how do I get started using free software? Well, the first thing you might want to do is learn a little bit about it. You can go to the bookstore and you can find books on Linux, how to install it, how to use it. Sometimes these books have a CD or DVD in the back that you can put in your computer and actually have it work. And then you follow along with the book on how to install it. Sometimes the people tell you in the book, just go to this website and copy the information down and install it on your computer. Either way is fine. But another way you can, you can get started is to go to DistroWatch. In DistroWatch, they have a, a description of every single distribution that people know about. It tells a little bit about the distribution, what it's good for, where you find it, what type of system it runs on, and you can read through those and figure out which distribution is the one that you would like to have. You can also go to either FreshMeet or SourceForge and look through the Linux distributions there. You can talk to people in local user groups. You can talk to people here at Campus Party and you can say to them, what distribution are you using? Why do you like that? Which distribution do you think would be good for me? And then they could show you their distribution and then you might want to be able to use that one. If you're at a university, maybe there's a Linux user group in your university. And you say, I'll use the same distribution that they're using for right now. Because they can help me if I have problems. And after a while, you become good enough that you don't care which Linux distribution you're using. People say to me, Mad Dog, what Linux distribution do you use? And I say, any one that my boss wants me to use. You know, I'm a consultant. If I go out to this company and they're using Red Hat, I use Red Hat. If they're using OpenSUSE, I use OpenSUSE. If they're using for Debian, I use Debian. It really doesn't make any difference. And after a while, you'll become so good that you'll go from distribution to distribution and you won't care. But for your average person, they say, I like this distribution because for some reason. And they stick with it and that becomes their distribution. But really, you're very portable. After you've selected a distribution, you might want to make sure that it works with your hardware. Now, Linux tends to work very well with systems that are Intel-based, AMD-based, even ARM-based. But those are only the CPU architectures. And underneath, there's a whole set of bus structures and different types of devices. So you may want to test your Linux system to make sure it works with the hardware that you want to put it on. And every once in a while, you'll find something that Linux does not support. The good news is, more and more, Linux supports more and more systems and more and more hardware. And less and less are there any issues with the hardware that Linux does not support. But if you want to test it out, what you can do is you can go to the website and look for things like hardware compatibility lists 
to see if Linux works well on your particular notebook or your particular desktop or with your particular graphics card. All you have to do is search for the number of your notebook or the number of your graphics card in the word Linux and sure enough you'll see it'll, pat, it'll pop up and say oh it works well or it doesn't. If you really want to figure out whether it works with your hardware or not you go to your, this, the website of the distribution you've chosen and you create what they call a live CD or DVD. You, you'll find that it'll guide you to place, it'll say make this, take this file, load it down to your system and burn a CD of it and then you can put that inside of your system boot it up, it will not touch your hard drive at all it won't touch your Windows system or your Mac OS system at all. It'll just run off of the CD and out of memory. And you can see whether or not it supports your graphics card or your networking card or some of the other things in your system. And you can test it out without even touching anything on your hard drive. Then when you're sure it works with all the hardware you have, you can make the decision to either continue running it as a live CD or installing it onto your hard drive. And there's many ways of installing it onto your hard drive and I'll explain those in a minute. So what you want to do is get is take a look at the size of the distribution which we call an ISO file a lot of times the file is small enough that it fits on a CD, so it have to be underneath under 700 megabytes. Or you may need to put it onto a DVD-R or read-write DVD. So that would be like 1 gigabyte or up to 3.4 gigabytes. And then you burn that particular image. And that becomes your live system. Then you go to try it out on your hardware. Now please back up your system. You know, even if you're using a live CD, sometimes you make a mistake and one little mistake wipes out your system disk and you know you probably haven't backed it up for six months. So do everybody a favor and back up your system if you start playing around with it. But then you can make a decision whether you store it on a spare disk. Maybe you have one disk which is your system disk and another disk which is empty. Or you can put another disk into your system. Then you can store, you can install Linux to that disk and boot off of that disk in order to run Linux. You can boot off your first disk in order to run Windows or Mac OS. You can also create a spare partition on your disk. As you start to install GNU Linux, it will allow you to shrink your Windows partition or shrink your uh, Mac OS partition. And then you can form another partition on your disk to install Linux. You can also, and, and after you've installed Linux, you'll install a bootloader which when you first start to boot up your system will allow you to choose either Windows or Mac OS or choose Linux. And this way you can dual boot back and forth between your operating systems. Another way you can install Linux is by the use of a virtual machine. You can take down a free copy of VMware or a free copy of Oracle's VirtualBox and you can install Linux into your virtual machine. And you can install many different Linux distributions into that virtual machine. And you can run that virtual machine and your other operating system at the same time. I'll show you in a couple minutes. I've installed a virtual machine. I have six different operating systems on there. And I can be running one of them or all of them at the same time and sharing the disk between all of them. Ubuntu has a thing called Ruby. 
And you can actually install Linux into your Windows system under Ruby and be running both Linux and Windows at the same time on the same machine. And here at Campus Party, over there in the free software area, we have an installation fest going on where people will help you install Linux if you want to. After you have the first Linux, part of Linux on there, there are repositories for every distribution where you can get additional software. Debian has over 27,000 packages that have been put together to run a Debian system. They have 2,900 package managers who manage those packages and put them together for the Debian system. So there's a huge amount of software that's available for you. And the entire Debian distribution now takes up six DVDs of binary-only software in their distribution. That's a huge amount of software. Now, I've only got two more slides before I start showing you how to actually install it. But I'd like to talk for a moment about these people right here. These people are friends of mine. I've known all of these people personally. The guy in the upper right-hand corner's name is Eric Trowen. I first met him when he was 22 years old. He was one of the three people who started Red Hat Software. Five years later, Eric was a multi-millionaire because he sold his shares of Red Hat. This person right here wanted to start a software company at the age of 19, but he needed a telephone system to do it, and a telephone system would have cost him 20 to 30,000 US dollars. So he decided to write his own. He made it open source. It's called Asterisk. And he created a company out of that called Digium. He is now a multimillionaire. This guy right here is not a multimillionaire, but he started programming at the age of nine, was hacking the Linux kernel at the age of 12, writing device drivers and being paid for it at the age of 15. At the age of 21, he was helping the FBI track hackers from Italy breaking into systems. And today at the age of 28, he's happily married and doing graduate work but he never graduated from high school. This guy right here was starting a, his own company in Soweto, South Africa, using dial-up networking to communicate with the world. He was helping Linus Torvalds debug errors in the memory management system of the AMD processor when we found him. And this guy right here started his own distribution at the age of 14. He had sold 20,000 copies of it before his parents found out what he was doing. When they said to him, why didn't you tell us? He said, I really didn't need your help. Finally, this guy right here, I met at campus party last year in Spain. He created his own distribution at the age of 12 and a half. At the age of 15, he started his own company to give support to it. And his friend on the other side, who's the same age, is his partner in this organization. I'm showing you all of these people because they were able to do what they did because of free software. Nobody asked them how old you are, what sex you are, what religion you are, what sexuality you are, over the internet. All they said was, show me the code. And you can go as far and as fast as you want to go, and there's nobody that's going to stop you. That's the promise of free software. So with that, what I'd like to do is turn this off, and hopefully I'll be able to map my graphics together here to show you my front screen. Doo -doo. So just take a second while I line up these two. Uh, yep, there we go. 
and I'm going to mirror the same magas and apply that. We should be fine in a second. Yep, there we go. Okay. Yep, that's really fine. And now what I'm going to do, this thing over here in the side, this thing right here, this is a um, virtual box from Oracle. This is available on uh, Windows, it's available on Mac OS, it's available on BSD and Linux. And what it is is a virtual machine. And you can install and run different kinds of operating systems inside the virtual machine and not touch your underlying disk or anything about it. So I'm going to boot up a copy of Ubuntu Linux. Now, what I'm running underneath here, this is actually Fedora. So I tend to install more graphics programs and more video editing and vi video manipulation and audio manipulation programs than the average person. But there are a huge number of programs that are available. And I'm not connected to the internet, so this isn't going to work so well. But this is a package manager here that if I was connected to the internet, could show you that there are thousands of packages which I could go down and look at and install on my Fedora system. So I'm going to go down here again to my virtual box and I'm going to start up the Ubuntu system and I'll show you what Ubuntu looks like. So I go here, doo -doo -doo -doo, I say start, it brings up a window, it tells me my mouse is, can either move in and out of this and be captured automatically. It's going to start up in a second. It's going to say there's a mitch mismatch between how big this little window is and what the what the actual software is capable of supporting. Oops, I got I got window I got Mint here for some reason instead of Ubuntu, but I'll show you Mint instead. That's okay. So this is a Linux distribution, it's called Mint. It's actually based on Ubuntu. And it adds in a few things like some audio codecs of things that Ubuntu leaves out. It makes a few changes to make things nicer for people. Hmm. Takes a little while for it to start up because it's in the virtual machine. gonna make a liar out of me this is what we call demo problems you know I mean you, you set it up you make sure it works and everything is fine and then you come here and you try and demonstrate it to people and you, you run into demo problems and I think one of the demo problems is I'm not connected to the internet and it's it's waiting for the internet to tell it something and that's why it's not continue oh, there we go okay we'll probably be okay now Yeah, it's, it's blinking down here. It's trying to access the internet and it's not, yep, waiting for network configuration and it's not getting it because I'm not connected. We haven't, oh, oh, wait a minute. Let me plug this in. Oh, no, I can't do that. Do we have an internet connection here? Oh, you guys have been sneaking my internet connections. You terrible people, you. I need a little bit more. I think we got it now. I think we, I think we, I think we, okay. All right, let's, let's try this. Because if I plug this in, it should take right off. Boop. Okay. Now let's see if we can get this to work right. Oh yeah, it likes that. Okay, it's, it's going to work better now.
Yeah, okay. So here's Linux Mint. And if I click on this, it'll show me stuff about my computer. It'll show me I have, I set up a virtual disk of 8.6 gigabytes. And I have a file system here. And I can make that go away. I can take a look at what's in my home directory by clicking on this. And there isn't very much in there because this is a brand new operating system that I installed. But I have a folder for my desktop. And I have a folder for my documents. And a folder for my music. And then I can go and I take a look at the applications that are available for me. And I have an archive manager for making an archive of programs. And I have a little calculator that, that I can use. And I have a program for burning disks. And I have a program for setting up character maps for all of your Brazilian funny, funny little characters that you know, I can't use on my English keyboard. And this uses you know, all sorts of what we call accessories. But then you have your graphics programs. And you have the ability to read PDF files. And you have the ability to manipulate uh, digital images like pictures. A little program called GIMP. You have the ability to view photographs from, from, from pictures. And different programs. Here's a program for drawing pictures as part of, of uh, open office or LibreOffice. And you have programs for the internet like your browser and, and communication programs, mail programs, I, uh, chat programs. Here's all of your office packages. So if you want to have a, if you want to start a letter, you can start up the, the letter. And remember, all of this is working through a virtual machine. So it's running a little bit slower than if it was running native on the actual hardware itself. And this is also, this is the first time I started this up, so there's a certain amount of background processing it's doing as starting up for the very first time. While that's starting up, we could say there's a whole series of tools for playing CDs, for playing movies, and things like that. And this all comes with the base software. But if I want to add other things, I can also do that. I can, come to, I can come up and I can look for system tools for adding new software to this system. And I can pull them down from the Linux Mint site and install that new software in addition to the software I already have. So Linux Mint is a very nice, easy to use, easy to install, you know, first Linux system if you would like to use it for that. So we can make that go away. Do a real quick reset. Yep. It's okay. We're going to shut off the virtual machine here. And let's see. Nope. We want to kill him. We want to switch to a different machine. So I can show you, yeah. yeah. Let's see if I can. Uh, let's see if I can get Poseidon to come up here. Nope, I'm getting mint again. That's a bad problem. I must have overridden, accidentally overridden um, Poseidon. Hmm. All right, I'll try Ubuntu Studio. No, it's Linux Mint. I'm sorry, folks. I must have done something wrong in installing this. It seems like I got Linux Mint for every single one. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to install, go through an installation of this on a virtual machine for you so you can see what the installation looks like. Kill this. And kill that. Come on. It's 
not doing very well at all. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to create a new virtual machine. And I'm going to call it test. I say I'm going to tell it that it's a Linux system. And this particular one is actually Mint, but it's based on Ubuntu. So I'm going to choose Ubuntu as the underlying distribution. I'm going to give it, I'm going to tell it that I would like it to simulate having two gigabytes of main memory. And that I want to create a new virtual hard disk in the file system of my base system. So if you're running Windows, you would have a new, you would have a virtual disk created in your Windows system or in your Linux system, you have a virtual disk created. And I'm going to later on make it a little bit larger than eight gigabytes, but I'm gonna create the disk at this point. I'm gonna tell it that make the disk small at first and expand it as necessary up to the limit. And then I'm going to tell it what the largest limit's going to be, and I'm going to give it 22.49 gigabytes. At that point, I have actually created my virtual machine, and it's down here, and it's called test. The next thing I have to do is link up my USB disk drive here which has a CD-ROM in it, and I'm going to hook that up to the virtual machine, and then I can start the virtual machine going. It's still talking to the virtual machine. I tell it to use a CD, which is in that drive as my installation, and I stop. And from now on, this is actually Linux Mint being installed into the system. And I'm going to tell it that what I want to do is, now well, something's wrong here. Because it's actually trying to start Linux Mint instead of starting the instead of taking off the CD-ROM. No. Okay, I'm going to show you something different because my virtual machine seems to be screwed up. Okay, remember I told you that you could run Linux as a live CD. In a moment, my whole system is going to reboot, and I'm going to be running Linux Mint as a live CD inside of my notebook. So my disk underneath is not going to be touched by, Lint, by uh, Linux Mint, but you'll be able to see it run. And I'll take you through a little bit of the installation. Now when you first boot the CD inside your system, it loads the kernel in, it creates a disk drive that's in the RAM memory of your system, and it loads everything into that except a lot of the programs to stay out on the CD. 
So what you're going to see is you're going to see Linux Mint as if it was running off of your hard disk, except it's going to be running off of the CD-ROM and out of memory. It takes a little bit of time to do that because there's a lot of code that has to be read off the CD and into memory. Okay, here is Linux Mint, and it's running as a live system off the CD, and you can see it's not much different than I was showing you from the virtual machine. In fact, it's exactly the same thing. You have your home directory filled with a bunch of different direct uh, folders for you to put your, your stuff into, and you have a whole series of different programs that are available to you through your, through your menus and through clicking on you know, little application folders like Firefox web browser. Now if you wanted to install Mint Linux from here onto your hard drive, you would click on this icon here, install Linux Mint, and it would take you through the entire uh, installation. But the problem with that is for me is that it would wipe out my Fedora system underneath, you know, so I don't really want to do that. But you have the ability to run Linux Mint live for a while to test out all of your hardware. So for me, I can test out and make sure that the network card is working, that the graphics card is working, that my disk drive is seen, that all my peripherals can be seen by clicking on computer. I can see all my different disk drives and I can see all my different peripherals. And I know that I am, you know, at least fairly far along to getting Linux to work on my system. Well, that's about it. Thank you very much. If you'd like to try and install Linux, uh, we'll be over there in the Linux installation area tomorrow, and I'd be happy to help you try and install Linux on your system. Thank you very much.